folks, we're going to be back in Mark chapter 5 again today. And the past few weeks, we, we've seen that Jesus is Lord over the storms, and he is. And we saw that, that he was Lord over demonic activity, and he is. And today we're going to see that he's Lord over sickness and that he's Lord over death. Now, look at what we've mentioned. We've mentioned storms, demons, sickness, death. All of these affect all of us in our lives. And the good news is, for Pakistan, we've been praying for Pakistan this morning, or, or for those of you that are here, and we've got some folks today that are sick. I don't care what your situation is, Jesus knows and Jesus cares. Now, my friend here this morning has already prayed, and he made this statement, and he's so right. I am so grateful that God is not dependent on our prayers to do anything. If he was, very little would get done because we don't know how to pray sometimes. We just don't know how to pray. Well, in Mark chapter 5, beginning in verse 21, I'm just going to read a few verses, then we'll talk about it. And we're going to go down to the end of the chapter, but we're going to go quickly. When Jesus had crossed over again in the boat to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him, and so he stayed by the seashore. One of the synagogue officials named Jairus came up and seeing him, fell at his feet and implored him with, implored him earnestly saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her so that she will get well and live. Let me stop there. If you don't understand all the things that I've been talking about, it's okay. Even if you don't even believe all of these things, it's still okay because you see it's not based on your faith. It's based on his faith. Sometimes, all the things that I've been talking about, just like with Jairus and all the things, it leads us to sometimes walking in fear. And I think that a lot of times Christians spend more of their time walking in fear than they do in faith. Mm -hmm. But again, God is not limited even when we're walking according to fear. Now, the sad part about it is God loves us even when we don't understand what's going on. But if we continue to walk in fear, then we'll miss so many blessings. But eventually, God is going to reveal himself to you because he loves you. Now, these are things that everyone has to deal with. Again, my friend this morning made a statement. His uh, wife is kind of staying home with the weather, and his little grandson's there. And he told us that they were going to have church at home, and that the grandson was going to do the preaching and going to lead the singing. And I thought that's pretty cool. And he said he has one message. And it's a good message. And the one message is, if you only have one message for anybody, and I don't care who it is, Jesus loves you. Mm -hmm. Now you say, you really don't believe that. Certainly I do. This man, Jairus, that came to Jesus, whose little daughter was dying, we know some things about him. First of all, he was a synagogue official. That means that probably for him to come to Jesus, that was a great step because that could lead to rejection by those around him. And yet his daughter was dying. You see, he was more afraid of not coming to Jesus, even though he came to Jesus in somewhat in a fear situation, but he was more afraid not to. He came to Jesus, and then the Bible says he fell at his feet in verse 22. <clears throat> he fell at his feet. He humbled himself not only to Jesus, but to everyone else. I believe that God wants us to walk in a lifestyle of total humility. Now, for many years, I thought that humbling yourself was what you did, and it was a sh an outward show, that you would fall on your face before Jesus. Well, there's nothing wrong with that, but you don't have to do that to walk with a humble state. See, being humble, the Bible says, humble yourself before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Being humble is not a bodily state. Being humble is walking in a total state of dependence. When you're walking in a state that's totally dependent on Jesus, that is humility. It is not what you say, it is not what you do, it is not how you act. It is a state of dependence, and this man had come to the end of himself. All that mattered was about to die, the daughter that he loved. And he came to Jesus and he fell at his feet in front of everyone. Now, Jesus knows about Jairus and his daughter. But I want to tell you, this is what Jesus felt toward Jairus. He didn't say, well, if you'd been coming to me sooner, this wouldn't have happened. Or this must be sin in your life or somebody's life. Had nothing to do with it. Jairus asked Jesus to come to him. Now, we've seen other situations where they said, you don't have to come. Just pray and it'll be done. Jairus didn't do that. 
Jesus said one time to the Romans, he said, I've not seen faith like yours any place, the Roman centurion. He said, I'm a man in authority, and there are those that are under authority under me. I say to this one, go, and he goes. I say to this one, come, and he comes. And he said, you don't have to come. All you have to do is say the word. And Jesus said, I've not seen faith like this any place in Jerusalem or in, in Israel. Now, Jairus didn't do that. But I'm going to tell you, Jesus didn't call him out on it. He just said, okay, I'll go with you. Now, I want you to see something. We're going to see this. All throughout Scripture, you're going to see this. Most of what Jesus does, he does it while he's on the way someplace. I said one day I was going to write a book, and I will. Lord willing, I really want to write a book. And one of the titles that I have for a book is Along the Way. Because just about everything that Jesus did, he did along the way while he was going someplace. Jairus had faith. He believed God would do something, but I'm going to tell you, he had little faith. He didn't have great faith. God doesn't bless because we have great faith. God blesses because he loves us. Mm -hmm. Jesus loved Jairus. Jesus loved his daughter. It wasn't the faith that was going to cause Jesus to heal this little girl. And the Bible says in verse 24, look in verse 24, and he went off with him, and a large crowd was following him and was pressing in on him. Jesus goes with Jairus. Big crowd. He had crossed over the sea. He was on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, this big lake. He was over there with the demoniac over in the Gerasenes. And he's crossed the sea again. He's back over on the Jewish side. He was over on the Gentile side. Now he's back over on the Jewish side. Big crowd. Jesus is still on the shore. Wasn't even able to come really in because there were so many people there. But Jesus is about to do some great things. Now, this next part, verse 25 through 34, this is a story about a woman who had an issue of blood that was, that was healed. You say, why does he jump around? He goes from Jairus to the woman with the issue of blood back to Jairus and his daughter because it's the same story. Understand this. This is not a parable. This happened. But this is basically the same story. While Jesus is going along the way, He's doing great things. It's the way he does it in your life. We have the idea he does things for us when we come to him, when we fall on our face and say, oh, Jesus. It's not that way. He does it because he wants to. Look in verse 25. A woman who had had a hemorrhage for 12 years. In another translation, it says an, an issue of blood. 12 years. Can you imagine bleeding for 12 years? In verse 26 and had endured much at the hands of many physicians. The same could be true today about many people. And had spent all that she had on Dr. Bills and was not helped at all, but rather had grown worse. Look at this. She's coming to the end of herself. Verse 27. After hearing about Jesus, she came up in the crowd behind him and touched his cloak. I used to say the woman had great faith. She had little faith too. I don't understand why she did it this way. Jairus came up to Jesus and fell at his feet. A big show in front of everybody. I'm not thinking he put on a show. But I think this was for Jairus and for the disciples and even for the people more than anything else. But here this woman came up behind Jesus and touched his cloak. Now, in another place it might say the hem of his garment. What they're talking about here came up literally and touched the rabbinical, the rabbinical tassel on his robe because Jesus wore rabbinical robes and he was a teacher. Touched the tassel on his robe. Verse 28, for she thought, if I just touch his garments, I will get well. In some ways, there was some superstition there. Immediately, the flow of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she had been healed of her affliction. Verse 30, immediately Jesus, perceiving himself in himself that the power proceeding from him had gone forth, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you and you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see the woman who had done this. And the woman, look at this, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. In verse 34, and he said to her daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Let's talk about this a minute. Had this woman with the issue of blood, and most of what's recorded here is, an, is a life in the day of Jesus. 
This is recorded, but this kind of stuff happened all the time in Jesus' life, just like you. Just think about sometimes you're with somebody and somebody may say, pray for me, I need this, or pray for me, my family's doing this or going through this. And I can just see Jesus at that time saying, okay, right then he would deal with it. And I believe many times when people ask us to do things like that, we should deal with it right where we are. I remember one time, Alan, it was a friend of ours, Robbie, and his mother was uh, ill with cancer. She, she wound up going to be with the Lord. And he said, will you pray for my mother? I remember we were in a grocery store. And I said, yeah, okay, let's pray right now. And so right there in the grocery store, we prayed for his mother. You say, well, it didn't work. She didn't get well. She, wait a minute. She's with Jesus. She's well. She's not hurting. She's not longing to be back on the earth. She is thrilled to be literally in the bosom of the Father. I remember he went to, I think you and maybe some other folks, but it got back to me. He said, I asked him to pray for me, and... I thought he would, but he did it right then. Just think about that if we keep short accounts with things like that. I'm not saying I do it right. Certainly not. But when God puts it on your heart to do something, do it right then. You prayed for my son a minute ago that, that God would give him the desire of his hearts because God is the one who gives you the desire of your hearts. He is the one who gives you that desire. Pray according to the desire that God has put on your heart. Walk in him. And you can know that you have the desire of your heart. He will give you how to pray. He will put it on your heart. Well, here she was. In this life, Jesus is on a journey, and this woman's on a journey. And she was, she was uh, sick, obviously sick, been sick for a long time. She'd not gotten any better, but she'd gotten worse for 12 years. She'd spent all she had with doctors. Am I against doctors? No, I am not. Some of my best friends are doctors that love the Lord. And you know, God uses doctors even when they don't love the Lord because God's in control of all things. But she'd not gotten better, only worse. There was no hope with this woman, with man. And I want to tell you, I don't care what situation you're in. If things are going well for you and it looks like everything is okay, there is no hope for you or for you or for you or for anyone with man. There is no hope in man. Jesus was her last hope. I want to say this. Jesus was her only hope. Jesus was her only hope even when she didn't know it. Now, God has allowed it so that she would now know that Jesus was her only hope. If she had gone through life well and had no need of Jesus and never knew Jesus, that would be tragic. But here, Jesus is letting her come to the end of herself so that she will turn to Jesus Jesus, being the last Adam, was her only hope. Now, this is a good thing. Instead of making the last Adam our last hope, why don't we think of the last Adam as our first and only hope? You see, the first Adam sinned. As a result, sin was imputed to all men. That's what happened. That's how we got this way. It wasn't because of your sin. It was because of Adam's sin. Say, so, yes, you've sinned, but that's how it started. Because of the last Adam, Jesus, the death, the burial, and the resurrection, the Bible says in Romans 5, 18, that the justification of life has been given to all men based on the last Adam. Let's start there rather than go there. What if we started there with everything we believe? That Jesus loves men, period, based on what he does. That Jesus has everything worked out, period, no matter what we see, based on what he does. Instead of making the last Adam our last hope, let's make him our only hope. In verse 27, it says, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched the cloak. She thought, if I just touch his garments, I'll get well, verse 28. Now I said, just kind of in passing, it's almost a superstition here. She didn't have great faith. One time I said it wasn't her faith that healed her. It was Jesus. Now, Jesus said your faith has made you well. But I'm telling you, folks, her faith was a gift to Je from Jesus to her. It wasn't her great faith. She was fearful. She was fearful. She wanted to be healed. But when she touched it, when she exercised the faith that Jesus had given her, which wasn't very big, immediately the flow of blood stopped. Immediately. Matthew, I mean, Mark uses that word a lot in his book here, immediately, because that's the way Jesus does stuff. Now, I want to say, 
All that Jesus was going to do had been done from eternity past on the cross. There's nothing left. Now, it hadn't happened yet at this time. It hadn't been fleshed out. But as far as God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit was concerned in eternity, all that was going to be done for all men has already been done. But immediately here, her flow of blood stopped. This was never about her. her. It never was. It was about Jesus. It was what Jesus was going to do. She was healed of her affliction, and Jesus is her healer. But even if she had died, Jesus is still her healer. Fact is, people die. People die. They do. Is that a bad thing? Well, I don't understand a lot of things, and I'm not praying that this one will die or this one will die. I was ready for my father to go be with the Lord. I was. But Alan, your father died in a, in a tragic way. He was murdered in a holdup, and that's a tragedy. And yet, as far as God is concerned, there's no difference between the way your dad died and the way my dad died. Because ultimately, it's the same. You see, when your dad died in a tragedy, it goes to be with the Lord. When my dad died at the end of a life, it, with a sickness, went to be with the Lord. Ultimately, God shows himself sufficient because he loved your dad and he loved my dad. So God is in control. I don't understand the way things go on, but God was in control. In verse 30, it says, Immediately Jesus, perceiving in himself that the power proceeding from him had gone forth, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? Now, I want you to see something. When he said, Who touched my garments? Or who touched me? Whose benefit was this that he said this for? You see, he is all-knowing. Even though he shelved his powers, he still had the power of the Holy Spirit. He knows everything. So for whose benefit was this that he said this? I think it was for the woman's benefit because she was exposed here. I think it was for the disciples' benefits because the disciples said, you're in this big crowd and you say, who touched me? I think it was for Jairus' benefit because Jairus, the synagogue leader who was taking Jesus to see his daughter who was about to die, he now sees that this woman was healed from an issue of flow of blood. I think it's for my benefit. I think when Jesus said, who touched me, it benefits me. I want to tell you this, there's nothing new under the sun. Samuel, our Saul said that in the book of Ecclesiastes, there's nothing new under the sun. God was in control then, God is in control now. Jesus is giving power, and he's giving healing. He's been calming the storm, he's been casting out demons, and now he's giving healing. But here he's making it known so that others' faith might be increased. He's making it known. Not because he needs to, but because he wants to. Now the problem is that people think he only does this for others. There are people that think that he would never do that for me. You see, I've got this need, and he was not done anything for me. Ask him. Ask him according to what, what he has told you to ask. Pray according to the way that he has led you to pray. You say, I've asked to be healed, and I haven't been healed yet. With this woman, it was 12 years. I don't understand why it went this way. Anybody that says, I understand totally this thing, I think they're fooling themselves. They're not fooling me. And there's some people that say, well, I don't believe in spiritual healing. Let me tell you something. Who says that? People who has nobody in their family sick. Or people that there's nobody close to them sick. I pray for people all the time. Do I always see it exactly the way I think it should be done? No. I don't always see it exactly the way I think it should be done. And we're going to see just in a minute how that there are others that didn't see it exactly the way that they thought it should be done. In verse 21, 31, his disciples saw the crowds and, and they almost chastised Jesus. And, and they see the crowds and they say, you see this big crowd and you say, who touched me? Today we see crowds. We see big numbers. Big numbers. And sometimes I'm afraid Christians are after big numbers in Pakistan. Sometimes you can draw a crowd there and you can draw huge crowds in the thousands and thousands. And, and my friend Peter Youngren that's been over there and preached many times, and they've had crowds of 250,000 people. You say in Pakistan? Yes, in Pakistan. And they've seen many people healed of many things. And, and a big percentage, most of those people that are there are not even believers. But I'm going to tell you this. We see crowds, but Jesus saw the individual. You see, 
he kind of pushed through the crowd and dealt with this one woman. And it's always been that way. Jesus sees the one. I don't care what situation you're in, you're the one Jesus sees. I don't care how bad things seem to be going for you, you're the one Jesus cares about. You're the one. You say, my life is a mess. You're the one Jesus cares about. You are the one that Jesus cares about. And I have a question. Plas to you, plas to me. Will you believe this? Will you believe that Jesus loves you? The one that you and others think has no hope is the very one that Jesus cares about. When you look at a situation of a man's life who's a mess or a woman's life, sometimes we see men that are doing vile and wicked things, vile and wicked things, and we think, man, he just deserves penalty. Going back to the demoniac, the one that Jesus dealt with, they had run him off. They had tried to chain him, and they couldn't. He would break the chains. They had tried all manner of ways to restrain him, and they couldn't, and they were afraid of him because he did vile and wicked things. He was a bad man. He was possessed by demons. But Jesus cared about that man. And when the demons left that man, he was sitting clothed and in his right mind at the feet of Jesus. Now you say, what's your point there? I don't have a point. I'm just going to tell you that when it looks like somebody so bad that nobody else can be around him, so wicked, Jesus loves that man. And Jesus would take that man and give to that man all that was his. You know why? Because that's why he came. He came to die for that man. I don't care who it is that you think that doesn't deserve anything. I don't care who it is in Pakistan. I don't care who it is here in the United States. I don't care who it is, no matter where anyone is, Jesus loves that man. The one that you think the others, with others has no hope, Jesus cares about him. This demoniac that we talked about last week, he was helpless. And he was hopeless without Jesus, and he didn't even ask for help. The demons came to Jesus, not the man. But Jesus met his need even when he could not ask. Well, we see the story of the, of the little girl. Verse 34. Let's, let's keep reading. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Going back to the lady. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. You know this word healed right here? I looked up that word. You know what that word means? It means literally saved. Saved. You see, with Jesus, with Him giving His life comes salvation. Oh, I believe you have to receive it. I believe you need to believe Him, but God's responsible for those things, not me. But you see, at the cross, everything was given. Healing, Salvation, oneness. One time when I was sharing this verse many years ago, it's one of the first messages I ever preached. I didn't understand some things then, but I remember I was preaching, and uh, it was at Prince Avenue Baptist Church, Johnny, many, many years ago. And I said this lady here was saved, and somebody came to me after and said, I never saw that before. Where do you get that? Where do you get that she was saved? Because it doesn't say that she prayed the prayer and got down, and they didn't sing just as I am. Where do you get right here that they were saved? Well, this word healed means saved. But more than that, do you think it's the character of Jesus to heal somebody and not save them? I don't think so. In fact, when I understand things that I do now, that the last Adam being Jesus has literally dealt with the sin of all mankind. Of course he saved this woman. Why? Because he wanted to. Okay, I'm going to go on. Verse 35. But while he was still speaking, they came from the house of the synagogue official saying, Your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher anymore? And Jesus, hearing what was being spoken, said to the synagogue official, Do not be afraid any longer. Only believe. Now, understand this. They've just come from his house. And they've said, Don't bother him. Your daughter's dead. Would you be afraid? Would you be grieved? I would be. Some people say, Well, I don't know. Sure you know. You'd be, t you'd be broken up. You'd be torn up. Bad news. Bad news. It can't get any worse. It can't get any worse. Some of you think right now it can't get any worse. The apple of this man's eye was dead. A 12-year-old little girl, dead. She was dead. They said, don't bother the teacher anymore. Your, te your daughter has died. Just give up. No hope. 
And Jesus said, don't be afraid any longer. Only believe. Here it is. This is for all the people then. It's for all the people now. Don't be afraid any longer. I don't care what's going on in your life. I don't know. I may never know. It doesn't matter. You don't even know what's going on in your life. You don't know the trouble. You don't know why any of this stuff's happening. But I'm going to tell you. I'm going to say it. Now listen. These are not my words. This is the word from the Lord. Do not be afraid any longer. Only believe. And you may say, well, that's easy for you to say. No, it's not. Because I deal with the same things you do. Man, I walk sometimes according to fear rather than faith. I walk according to the flesh sometimes. That's not my true identity, but sometimes I do that. And Jesus sometimes, just like with you, he has to let you come to the end of yourself when you say there's no hope but you. And he says, that's right. And then you say, meet me at my point of need. And he says, I already have. In verse 37, and he followed, I'm sorry, and he allowed no one to accompany him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. Now they put, they put the, the crowd aside right here. Just the father, Peter, James, and John. Verse 38, they came to the house of the synagogue official and he saw a commotion and people loudly weeping and wailing. They got to the house. There's a great commotion. People loudly weeping and wailing. Let me tell you how they used to do this. First of all, this Jewish synagogue official, we don't know what his position was, but I feel like it was a high position. But in that day, when someone died, they would have professional mourners, professional weepers, wailers, if you will. And it was like the bigger the show that was put on, the greater you missed them. And all, there's all this weeping and wailing going on at the synagogue official's house. And here's what Jesus does in verse 39. And entering in, he said to them, Why make a commotion and weep? The child has not died, but is asleep. Now, I want to tell you something about Jews. They recognized death when they saw it. The girl was physically dead. She was dead. Physically. And Jesus said, why make a commotion? She's not dead, but asleep. Look in verse 40. And they began laughing at him. And putting them all out, he took along the child's father and mother and his own companions and entered the room where the child was. When you begin to believe things that look impossible, people are going to laugh at you. People are going to ridicule you. When you believe that Jesus would say, as he has, when Jesus would give life to people that you would not give life to, that Jesus would reveal himself when he does it, that's his business, to people that seemingly have no hope, people will laugh at you too. It's all about life. You see, Jesus has given life. Romans 5.18. It says, because of the death, burial, and the resurrection of the last Adam, he has given justification of life to all men. It has been given. Completed action doesn't need to be done again. I believe that men need to receive this. I don't understand why people don't. They need to receive it, but it's been given. This little girl had already been given life even though she was physically dead. Jairus, he could have done one of two things here. He could have believed him or not. Personally, it would have been very difficult for me to say, I believe you. I believe you're going to give the life of my daughter back. Anyway, they began laughing at him. In verse 41, when Jesus had gone into the room there, he said, taking the child by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which translated means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Now, folks, this is an impossible situation. An impossible situation. It is a situation where there is no hope. In verse 42, Immediately, the little girl got up and began to walk, for she was 12 years old. And immediately, they were completely astounded. Isn't it amazing how people are astounded when Jesus does what he said he would do? Now, they physically saw this. But folks, Jesus is doing things that we can't physically see. But do we only believe Jesus for what we can physically see? If he's doing something here that we got the privilege of seeing, even though we weren't there, we see the result of it. And there are going to be others that saw the result. Let me tell you, there are two different groups right here. There's the group of people that were in on and got to see the life being given. And then there were the groups of people that saw the result of the life being given. 
Now the ones that only saw the result of the life that had been given, the little girl walked outside and she was alive again. You see, some of them may think, well, she really wasn't dead. Maybe she wasn't dead. She was just ill. She was just sick. She just passed out. But she wasn't really dead. Folks, she was dead. Men are dead physically, spiritually without Jesus. They are dead. But do we believe that Jesus has done what he said he would do? Used to, I would keep track of the people that I had the privilege of being there when they trusted Christ. I would say, people that I led to the Lord. And I believe God has gifted me in that area, and I had the privilege of seeing a lot of people trust Christ. But I'm going to tell you, it's so much bigger than what I can see. You see, now I'm beginning to understand that God is going to do great things with great numbers that I may never see and don't have to see it. Sometimes today, people are afraid that people would sneak into this salvation without really deserving it. Folks, none of us deserve it. Now I'm thinking, Lord, you be God. I trust you. I don't understand it all. But I believe that you've done everything for all men for one time on the cross, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. I also believe that people need to believe this, but... But I don't understand this seeming contradiction. But folks, because it's a seeming contradiction to me doesn't mean it's a contradiction to Jesus. I want to believe it. There was the bad news brought. And the father went in with Jesus and got to see his daughter raised. And in verse 23, something big happens right here. And he gave them strict orders that no one should know about this. Now why would he do that? Because he knows that they would talk about the act more than the fact. Mm -hmm. The fact that Jesus is the one who gives life. That's the fact. And it's exactly what people do today. They talk about the act of salvation rather than the fact of life. This is a fact. Jesus gives life. And then he said something that's really big. And he said that something should be given her to eat. Give her something to eat. We're still called to give something to eat to the people that Jesus has given life. What do we feed on? We feed on the body, the blood. We feed on Jesus. What is it that we need to tell people? From the time children of little, but my children, I told them, Jesus loves you. As they get older, I want to tell them, Jesus loves you. I don't care who you meet. I don't care what situation it is. And folks, there are some things that are going on in the world that are horrible. And there are Christians that are being tormented in horrible ways and persecuted. It's going on in your country. And it's going on in places around the world. But I can tell you, even though it looks hopeless and helpless, Jesus loves those folks that are doing the tormenting. I don't understand that. And that the life that he has given on the cross was for them too. Give her something to eat. Talk about the death, the burial, and the resurrection. It starts there and it ends there. This is his story, history. It's about him. The book, this book, it's about Jesus. It's about what he's done. You can believe this book, but you can believe him on the inside. When you see somebody, I don't care who they are, you can look them in the eye and you can know this one fact, Jesus loves that person. You can know this, that Jesus died and was buried and was raised for that person, the one person. You can look at the crowds, but you're going to see one person at a time. Jesus loves them. And as you begin to see people one at a time, the way that you see people will change forever. It's easy to really be angry at the crowd. It's easy. But when you look at somebody and you know they're hurting people, I don't understand this. And I'm certainly not going to stand here and tell you that's the way I do things all the time, because it's not. But that is the way Jesus does things. And as we begin to look at things from His perspective, our perspective changes. Well, I don't have anything else for you this week. I just want to tell you, whether it's the storm, whether it's sickness, or whether it's death, Jesus knows, Jesus cares, and Jesus is in control. Believe Him. He is life. And He gives His life.
that He is to you. You will have peace that passes all understanding because He is peace. Without Him, there is no peace. But when you know Him, you will know peace. Don't care what you're going through. God's got it. He's in control. I love you, and we'll see you next time.